Hello, folks. Welcome. Good to see you all. This is the session entitled Helping Children Develop a Biblical Worldview by Jill Nelson. Uh, if you have pre registered, please feel free to fill in these seats that have the pink slip on them. Those are very important to make sure that we have feedback from you all to know how we can uh, move forward well in the future. So please do fill those out and um, you can either leave them on your seats or, or p pass them in at the doors. We would really like those back. This session is being translated. You guys can go ahead and pass, out the, pass those out. This session is being translated, so channel four is in Spanish if you have a headset. Uh, let's see, is there anything else I need to say? Uh, Jill will be staying uh, only 15 minutes after the session to answer questions if you have any. Um, and I think that's about it. So I will pray and we will get started. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Thank you, Father, for sending your Word to earth for us to know him, to know Jesus Christ. He is our worldview, Lord, so would you change our worldview to make it like Jesus, and would you use this time to train us, to teach us how to impart that worldview to the young people that are in our classes? Would you fill us with joy and anticipation in what you have for us? Would you be with Jill? Would you give her strength, help her to speak in the strength that you supply? Would you give her clarity? Would you guard her words? Would you guard this place from Satan? and his minions. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again, that he has uh, made a way for us to live with you. What, what wonder. Thank you so much, Father. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Amen. Well, recently on Dr. Al Mohler's blog, he had an article related to an event that happened in the news recently. And here's what he said. The state of Iowa takes high school wrestling seriously. Iowans take wrestling so seriously, in fact, that the state wrestling champion among high school boys in Iowa is like Mr. Basketball in Indiana, a celebrity for life. Joel Northrup is the only, only a sophomore, but the homeschooled student who wrestles from Linmar High School went into the state wrestling tournament with a 35 and four record and high hopes. Nevertheless, his first match, he defaulted. Why? Because he could not, by conviction, wrestle against a girl. In a statement released to the media, young Northrup said, I have tremendous amount of respect for Cassie and Megan and their accomplishments. However, wrestling is a combat sport and it can get violent at times. As a matter of conscience and faith, I do not believe that this is appropriate for a boy to engage a girl in this manner. It is unfortunate that I have been placed in a situation not seen in most other high school sports in Iowa. Joel's dad also weighed in and stated, we believe in the elevation and respect of women, the father told the Des Moines Register, and we don't think that wrestling a woman is the right thing to do. Body slamming and takedowns, full contact sport is not how to do that. Well, in response to these remarks from the father, columnist for ESPN stated, that's where the North ropes are so wrong. Body slams and takedowns and gouges in the eye and elbows in the ribs are exactly how to respect Cassie. That is what she lives for. She can elevate herself, thanks. And not to be outdone, a guest blogger at Christianity Today commented the following. 
My guess is that his decision, meaning Joel's decision, to default has more to do with his view who is against him on the mat than it does with actual violence. And I think his refusal has more to do with his cultural view of girls than his Christian faith. One small wrestling match in Iowa and the national media is all over the story. The name of the article by Dr. Moeller, Boys Wrestling Girls, A Clash of World and World Views. World Views. Our worldview is the presuppositions, assumptions, or framework through which we ter interpret reality. Everyone has a worldview, even about a wrestling match. Furthermore, worldview matters. It informs how we think and it shapes how we respond. Joel's view of men, women, and sports was not merely theoretical, it also shaped his words and actions. But worldview is more than just our view of men, women, and sports. It's also about the most important realities in all of life. For the example, for example, the reality of the existence of God and his character and purposes, why we exist and how we should live, what is wrong with the world, and what is the solution. Now, all people are asking these questions about these realities, even if they don't explicitly acknowledge it. And our worldview is like a set of lenses through which we see these realities and try to make sense of them. So it's also important that we understand that worldview encompasses all of life. Our initial mindset informs our thinking about everything, and our thinking then shapes how we respond to everything. Now, as we saw through the article, not everyone sees things the same way. And in the question of the wrestling, who is right? Or did everybody just have a valid opinion about the matter? John Calvin can be helpful here for us. He said, for by the scriptures as our guide and teacher, God not only makes those things plain that would otherwise escape our notice, but he almost compels us to behold them as if he had assisted our dull sight with spectacles. In other words, those people watching the wrestling match were looking at it, and some of them weren't noticing things that should be plain. Things escaped their notice. But the scripture compels us to notice them. And the scriptures act like the corrective lenses that we need to rightly see everything in life. I think last night, John Piper made the case for this. We cannot rightly see and interpret reality apart from the truth of scripture. It provides the only sure lenses through which to understand the way things really are, reality itself. And as parents and teachers, we must teach our children and acquaint them with the corrective lenses of scripture. That's what biblical worldview is all about, seeing and interpreting all of life through the truth of scripture. So what I'm gonna do now is give eight things that we can be doing with our children to encourage them to have a biblical worldview, to see everything through the truth of scripture. And so I'm gonna start with number one. We need to teach our children that God is the source of all truth and his word, the Bible, is truth. What characterizes biblical truth? Well, let's look at five different things to begin with. Biblical truth is objective, meaning it's independent of us. It comes from a source outside of us, namely God. All scripture is breathed out by God, as Second Timothy tells us. Jesus said, your word is truth. Truth comes from outside of us as human beings. It comes from God himself. 
The second thing we need to understand about biblical truth is that it's absolute, meaning it's fixed and immovable because God is the highest authority. God decides what is true and right, and it's not up for negotiation. The third thing we need to understand about biblical truth is that it's universal, meaning it applies to all people because God rules over all. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, God desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, especially in the truth regarding the gospel. Timothy goes on to say, I mean, Paul goes on to say, one God, one mediator between God and man, namely Jesus Christ. That applies to all people in all cultures. The fourth thing we need to understand about biblical truth is it's unchanging because God's perfections never change. Biblical truth does not change. It stays. The word of our God will stand forever. And the fifth thing we, fifth thing we need to know about biblical truth is it's knowable. God has communicated his truth through his word, the Bible. He has not kept his truth secret. So one of the things that we need to conclude from these five characteristics of God's truth is that God's truth is authoritative and all people are under its authority. Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 states, for the word of God is living and active, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So how can we help our children see this truth in the Bible and respect its authority? Well, one thing we can do is assume the absolute truthfulness of the Bible as you teach. Young children need statements of fact, not a defense of those facts. We should teach with confident authority, not using wishy-washy language, and focus mainly on what the Bible says is true and not on competing arguments to that truth. Now, as the children grow older, you can introduce them to some competing arguments and provide articulate defense for biblical truth, but when we teach, we should teach with the assumption and with the absolute confidence that the Bible is truth. A second thing we can do is use correct biblical language when we teach. For example, don't say God asked such and such when the Bible text clearly says or implies a command. So we're rightly emphasizing the objective and absolute authority of God's word. For example, God didn't ask Abraham to leave his country, his kindred, and his father's house. God said, go. God didn't ask Abraham if he felt like offering Isaac as a sacrifice. God told him to do it. And for us, God doesn't ask us if we feel like abhorring evil and clinging to what is good. He tells us to do it. Another thing we can do is emphasize the clarity, necessity, and sufficiency of scripture. There's a growing movement that says the Bible isn't really clear or that it doesn't really speak to today's culture or problems. In other words, after more than 2,000 years, the Bible's no longer adequate. And as evidence, many point to point out that the Bible doesn't specifically address certain modern topics. We must make it clear to our children the nature of the Bible. It is not meant to be a comprehensive topical encyclopedia. However, it does address all essential truths that all people must know and respond to. Truths that answer the most important questions regarding God, man, Jesus, redemption, and how we're to live in relation to God. And it does serve as a sure guide for all of life, including every modern experience we have. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet 
and a light to my path. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Those truths are unchanging today. The next thing we need to do is include a global perspective as we teach. God's truth apply to all people regardless of geography, language, ethnicity, and culture. When you teach in this way, you are emphasizing the universal nature of God's truth to the children. Another important thing that we can do is teach children what it means to be under the authority of another, especially God and his word. Dr. Moore uh, made that very clear this morning. One of the growing problems in Western culture is the decline of a healthy respect for authority. And we see this evidenced everywhere, in the home, in schools, in the public square. As parents and teachers, we need to rightly model what it means to be under God's authority and even general authority. Now, here's an example. Suppose you get a ticket speeding and you brush it off as if it really doesn't matter, saying something like, the speed limit's stupid anyways. I always drive faster than it states. It's no big deal. What are you conveying to children about authority by that kind of attitude? Is that giving them a respect for authority in general, or even God's word, which says in Romans 13 2, therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed? We need to carefully model what it means to be under authority, especially God's authority. So we need to ask ourselves, do we treat God and his word as the supreme authority in our own lives? Do our children and students see us humbly submit to God's word, even in difficult situations? And even aside from making direct connections to God's authority, we must be careful to teach our children about authority itself. And oftentimes this is where we inadvertently train our children to have a weak view of authority. For example, we establish very weak or non-existent authority structures in our homes and classrooms. Dad and mom are constantly asking children whether they would like to do something, or we preface everything with please, as if we need to apologetically ask for obedience, or we give a children a sense that everything is negotiable. Um, one example, when I was in first grade one year, the worship leader, every single song, she would always ask the kids, would you like to sing this song? Would you like to sing this song? What she was inadvertently doing was teaching the children that you are your own little self-rule and you get to decide everything. Now, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not saying we should never give children choices or have them particip participate in making decisions. However, the current culture seems bent on removing all sense of authority, giving children a very dangerous sense of individualism and self-rule. And we have to ask ourselves, will that give them a proper understanding of what it means to live under God's sovereign rule? Will it prove prepare them for recognizing the truth that God alone decides what's right and true and not my individual feelings or preferences. Next, we need to emphasize that we must test everything by the absolute truth of the Bible. We should be asking our kids questions. What does the Bible say about this? Or how does this measure up to the Bible? And we need to make sure that we stress that if something contradicts clear biblical truth, it is not true no matter what, even if 95% of the people say it's true. We need to teach our children that our feelings do not decide what is true, rather our feelings are to conform to the truth of scripture. Uh, blogger Justin Taylor recently explained how God used the following words 
by R.C. Sproul to snap his resistance to some of God's revealed truths. Sproul had said, you are required to believe, to preach, and to teach what the Bible says is true, not what you want the Bible to say is true. Jeremiah 17, 9 kind of gets to the core of this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our sinful nature cries out, I will decide what is true and right. And we must challenge ourselves as well as our children to recognize that God decides what's true and right. And our feelings must conform to his truth because his truth will not conform to our feelings. You are required to believe, to preach, and to teach what the Bible says is true, not what you want the Bible to say is true. So just a review of point number one, we need to teach our children that God is the source of, source of all truth and that his word, the Bible, is truth. Now, is this how our culture sees the Bible? No. The Bible is constantly under attack, and we and our children need to know this, and it's important that we know something of our enemy and his schemes. Where's our main opposition coming from? Well, Satan himself. He is described by Jesus as the father of lies, and he blinds sinners to the truth by offering competing truth claims. Here are just a sample of some of these competing claims. Um, naturalism, secularism, and atheism. Especially in the area of science, science has become the new truth claim of the age. The basic argument is that science, especially Darwinism, evolution, now provides a comprehensive explanation for life and for everything in life. And the so-called new atheists, such as Richard Dawkins, are making very articulate and well-received arguments. We need to understand that these arguments are coming from a worldview. Science as defined by human understanding is not ultimate. So we need to be very careful to examine the claims of science. Atheist Thomas Nagel made a very honest revelation. He said, I want atheism to be true. It isn't just that I don't believe in God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. And if you're a scientist with that worldview, it will taint everything you claim to be truth. We need to make our kids aware of this. Another way that Satan blinds people to the truth is by offering the truth claims of other religions, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Mormonism, and New Age, etc. The list could go on. We are living in an age steeped in multiculturalism, inclusivism, and a call for tolerance. But we must be very careful because with this comes competing claims to biblical truth. To sort these out, especially our older students, need to be taught some of the key claims of the world's major religions, especially ones they come in intimate contact with. Maybe a neighbor down the street is a Muslim. So we need to be giving our kids some explanations, asking what are the claims of Islam? How do Muslims understand Jesus and salvation? How do their claims measure up to the absolute truth of the Bible? And it's also important that we help our children to see how these false religions influence our culture. It's more than we know and would admit to. For example, look at how much Eastern mysticism is now being used in various educational settings, counseling, and even sports training and physical fitness. There's danger there. Are we teaching our children to measure these ideas and practices with the absolute truth of the Bible? However, there is a new kid on the block now called postmodernism. And 
it's much more subtle at times than some of the other truth claims. Basically, what postmodernism has done is redefine truth to be something very different. It gives characteristics to truth such like, truth is subjective. It's self-derived, it comes from within me. It says that truth is relative and has no fixed appearance. Express, it expresses equally valid truth claims. Everybody decides for himself. It's individual. It's the right of each individual or culture to define truth for whatever works for them. It defines truth as changeable. It's always being made. It defines truth as uncertain. You never can be absolutely sure if something's really true. Now, what does postmodernism look like in practice? Well, I'm gonna show you a small sample from a 2008 presidential debate. And the question was put to the candidates whether or not they would want their own children to be read a children's storybook in which a prince marries another prince. And here is how one candidate replied. Yes, absolutely. And I sus suspect my two younger children will reach the same conclusion that my daughter, who is 25, has reached, which is she doesn't understand why her dad is not in favor of same-sex marriage. And she says her generation will be the generation that brings about great change in America on that issue. So I don't want to make that decision on behalf of my children. I want my children to be able to make that decision on behalf of themselves. And I want them to be exposed to all the information, to all the possibilities, because I don't want to impose my view. Nobody made me God. I don't get to decide on behalf of my family or my children. I don't get to impose on them what it is that I believe is right. Do you see the relativism in his words? All of those possibilities. Do you see the subjectivism? Decision on behalf of themselves. Do you see the changing nature? It's going to be a, a change in America now. We're going to change the way things are done and the individual nature. I don't get to impose on them what is right. They get to do that. Perhaps though one of the greatest dangers of postmodernism is that it has subtly crept into the church. Undetective sometimes and sometimes even encouraged. Some evidences that postmodernism has crept into the church could be as follows. Scripture is being reduced to behavior modification therapies. In other words, the main purpose of the Bible is to make my personal life more successful. It's a wonderful self-help book, and individuals should take those verses and truths that best apply to their specific needs, whatever works for you. Or we study the Bible by asking, what does it mean to me? Now, this doesn't seem so terrible, does it? However, Asking the question like this fuels our desire to make scripture conform to our feelings and experience. In other words, subjectivism. The question we need to be asking is what does this text mean? What is the author's intent? Uh, recently, I was counseling a young woman who had made a very important decision in her life and she had not made it according to biblical truth. And we sat down and we looked through the scriptures regarding her situation that addressed the issue. And she said, well, yeah, I agree with these scriptures in general, but you know, I, this situation is different and I've prayed about it. I feel at peace about it and good things have happened through my decision. You see, she wasn't asking, what is God objectively saying in these texts, she was asking, this is the way I feel about the situation. Now, how do, how do these texts apply to me? And if they don't apply, then I can ignore them. That's a very dangerous way of looking at scripture. Another way postmodernism makes itself seen in the church is the acceptance of competing and unbiblical truth claims. 
There has been a dangerous trend within the evangelical church to accept new interpretations and perspectives on biblical truths. If any of you have been in the Christian blogosphere in the last two weeks, there is a huge uproar over hell. Hell is under fire. Basically, <laughs> no pun intended. There are a growing number of pastors and scholars who are rethinking hell. Well, you know, it's more symbolic than real. And their main arguments seem to be, we don't like the idea of hell as described in the Bible. We don't like a God that would condemn people to hell. Therefore, hell must really mean something different than what people have originally understood it to mean. So we'll change our understanding of hell. Or another influential group of evangelicals has now proposed that we much must accept evolution as truth, or it will become irrelevant, and Adam and Eve were merely symbolic figures. We're not to take them historically. This is coming from within the church, from professing Christians. Another way, softening biblical truth in order to be more seeker-friendly. Um, a new church moved into our neighborhood, so I went on their website to see what they were about. I could not find anywhere on their website any doctrinal statement of what they believe. It was all about we are a warm, welcoming community to, here to help your family and to have your family have a more successful life. Very seeker-friendly, but no truth. Or there's a growing reluctance to take clear biblical stands because they might be offensive to the culture. Postmodernism likes to boast of its tolerance of divergent views. They're only opinions and personal beliefs, and it's arrogant to impose your beliefs on others. So the church shrugs away from taking stands on things like the roles of men or women or homosexuality or same-sex marriage. We don't want to offend anybody, do we? Or, we might see an unhealthy craving to blend in with the culture. Wanting to be so relevant that we become so much like the world that the world can't even see a difference anymore. We are no longer than light or salt. So if our children are to have a biblical worldview, they must be taught and continually reminded that the Bible is God's authoritative truth and that we must teach them to recognize these competing truth claims for what they are. They are lies of Satan. Secondly, we need to teach our children a biblical understanding of God's nature and character. Um, as all of you have heard, in January 2010, a devastating earthquake struck Haiti, one of the poorest countries in the earth. And there were numerous pastors and priests and theologians weighing in on their interpretation of how and why this happened. And most were trying to do theological somersaults to make sense of it. And they were doing it with a distorted view of God and his character. And this brings up another important point, as noted by Dr. Moeller. He said, Inevitably, our concept of God determines our worldview. The question of the existence or non-existence of God is primary, but so is the question of God's power and character. Theologians speak of the attributes of God, meaning the particulars of God's revealed nature. If we begin with the right concept of God, our worldview will be properly aligned. If our concept of God is sub-biblical, our worldview will be sub-biblical as well. In other words, if our children are to have a biblical worldview of things like disasters and calamities and suffering, those hard truths, we first need a right view of God and his character. So how can we help our children with this? Well, first of all, is provide them with a comprehensive study of the doctrine of God. Teach all of his attributes, not just a few select that emphasize a particular flavor for example, if children are simply taught that God is loving and good and compassionate and forgiving, they will not have all the proper categories for understanding earthquakes, suffering, and death. They also need to see from scripture that God is holy and just, almighty, and sovereign. 
So we must affirm that God was sovereign over that earthquake. And we must affirm that God is good and right in all he does. Now, how can these two statements make sense? That's what caused many of those theologians to do somersaults. Many of them just simply chose to cut God down to size and say, well, maybe God isn't as great as he says he is or he wouldn't have allowed this to happen. But the Bible doesn't give us, but the Bible does give us the right categories for understanding what God is like. For example, the Bible tells us that God is indeed absolutely sovereign, even over disasters. The Bible does affirm that God is good and loving. The Bible does affirm that God is right in all he does. And disasters therefore display both God's judgment and his mercy. This world, including the physical world, is under a curse of man's sin. Therefore, no one can accuse God of being unfair if he chooses to send an earthquake. It is a demonstration of his mercy that any of us live and breathe for even one moment. It is a mercy that some who died are now enjoying eternal life in heaven. It is a mercy that many who didn't die have been warned about the brevity of life and their need for a savior. Do we fully comprehend how this particular earthquake mingled and displayed these truths about God? No, we don't. But we do need to give our cat children a category even for that. As Paul states in Romans 11, 33 and 36, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Through this biblical lens, we can rightly see and interpret as much as the Lord allows us what happened in Haiti and the other many troubling things in our world and lives. Evil, war, terrorism, sickness, suffering, and even death. You know, if we don't give our kids a biblical understanding of those hard things, the world is very ready to give them an understanding, and it will be a lie. If we give our children a smaller, distorted understanding of God, we will limit and distort their ability to see and interpret reality, especially hard truths. Also, in giving our children this big vision of God, it will remind them of who they are in relation to God. He is their creator. We are the creatures. He is independent, we are dependent. He is holy, we are sinful. He is ruler, we are his subjects. Our natural inclination at worldview topics is usually, I will decide what's the truth about this instead of I will submit to God's truth in this. And that's because we have adopted a big view of ourselves and a little view of God. Another way we can give our children a big vision of God is to use everyday experiences and news events to remind them of God's attributes. For example, every day the heavens declare the glory of God. Every day God reveals his greatness and work. Make these connections with your children. When you watch, the th when you watch lightning and hear the thunder, Tell them that this is a small glimpse of God's almighty power. When you eat a treat, tell them that this is a glimpse of God's wonderful provision. A rainbow is a sign of God's faithfulness. A day with friends demonstrates God good, God's goodness. When you hear about terrorism and wars and evil events, it shows the terrible consequences of sin and living in a fallen world and should point us to the only remedy, and that is Jesus. The third thing we can do is teach our children that biblical truth is relevant to everything in life. We have spent, um, several of our speakers have used Colossians chapter 1, 16 and 18. All things, all things, all things. 
or 2 Timothy chapter 3, where all scriptures breathed out by God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Pastor Tulian Chivinian, I always say his last name wrong, I'm so sorry, said this, the Bible is not simply a manual for understanding things of a spiritual nature, it's earthier than that. It provides us with a comprehensive framework for understanding all of reality. It presents an entire worldview, a complete perspective on all of life. How can we help our kids see the relevancy of scripture in everything? Well, first off, intentionally make connections between biblical truth and everyday life experiences. John Piper once used the illustration of dangling wires. And these dangling wires aren't connected. And he said one set of wires is the greatness and majesty of God, and the other set of wires is everyday life. And he said there seems to be a disconnection between the majesty of God and the movies you watch. God is great and majestic, and that majesty includes his holiness. Therefore, we must intentionally make the connection from God's holiness to the movies we watch and the movies our children watch. We and our children are not naturally inclined to see these connections. Or take another example, Facebook or other social networking sites. We have God is holy and morally pure. And we have the daily experience of our kids going on Facebook, for example. Have we demonstrated to our children that biblical truth is relevant to this hugely popular and influential mode of communication? We help, need to help them connect the wires. For example, Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to hear, to those who hear. Connect the wires. But this is just one example. What about the following with a younger child? Connect the chores they do around the house with the Bible's teaching on work. Ask questions to get them to think about how work relates to God. For example, does God work? What kind of work does God do? Can you give me examples from the Bible? Why do you think that God wants us to work? How does your work help our family? How does work help you? What kind of attitude should you have when you empty the trash and watch, wash the floor? Let's look at what the Bible says. Or another example, suppose you've just watched a sporting event together with your child and the winning team is boasting about how great they are you can relate this experience to biblical truth. For example, what do you think of their boasting? Did they achieve this all on their own? What does the Bible say about boasting? Why do you think that we like to boast about ourselves sometimes? Compared to what God has done and all that God has achieved, is winning a game really that great? Does that mean that playing sports and competing is wrong? What does the Bible say? How can someone honor God while playing sports? The list is endless because every experience in life is an opportunity to make the connection to God's truth, even for a toddler. For example, you go to the zoo and you're looking at all the animals. You would say something like, look at that beautiful sea lion. Look at his cute little nose and those long whiskers. Wow, watch how fast he can swim and turn around and round. God made him that way. God probably laughs as he watches a sea lion and does his tricks. Isn't God great? This might seem like an ins insignificant example, but it's not. You are teaching a toddler to see and interpret everything in life through the truth of scripture. Another thing we need to do is help our children to see that the Bible contains the only reasonable explanation of the world in which we live. When you carefully examine the world's various explanations for how and why the world exists, what our purpose is here, why there is suffering and evil in the world, and then compare that to what 
scripture says, it becomes very apparent that the Bible offers the only reasonable, comprehensive explanation. The Bible leaves no stone unturned in regards to history, humanity, and daily life. Another thing we can do is challenge them to see their own feelings, words, and actions in light of scripture. My kids still laugh at this, but growing up, one of the most common phrases in our household was, give me a verse. In other words, I wanted my kids, no matter what they were feeling about something, you need to give me a verse to back up your feelings. I wanted them to have to interpret their feelings in relation to scripture. I can't remember the situation, but my son was having this really bad attitude toward his sister one day, surprise, surprise. And um, so I told him, give me a verse. So he, he picked out some verses, but they were either in the wrong context or they were a negative example. And I said, no, that won't do. I need a verse where God says, this is the right feeling you're supposed to, or this is the right expression or attitude you're supposed to have. Finally, he said, mom, this isn't fair. And I said, why not? He said, because I can't win. Exactly. God doesn't conform to our feelings. Our feelings are to conform to his truth. We can also point out the natural consequences of right and wrong thinking on any given topic. For example, in a recent book, famed physicist Stephen Hawking declared that God is not necessary for explaining creation because there's gravity and that explains it all. Okay, well, how does this explain design and beauty, love and compassion? How can anyone determine what's right or wrong? In other words, there's a consequence to his statement. The consequence is no God, there's no basis for evil, no basis for good, no basis for moral governance in the world, no purpose in life, utter despair and chaos. That's a natural consequence. We need to show our children the consequences of those, that kind of thinking. Galatians 6, 7 and 8 talks about God not being mocked. What we sow, we will reap. There are consequences. Our worldview has consequences. And too many times we minimize the natural consequences of a particular viewpoint, or we only emphasize the big issues and our children need to be taught that their view of anything will bear some type of consequence. If they embrace God's truth, the consequence will be life-giving and soul-satisfying. We also need to teach our children the whole counsel of God so that they see the comprehensive scope of scripture. The more scripture we present to our children, the more they will see its depth. It addresses a myriad of topics and experiences, economics, friendship, pet care, prejudice, possessions, work and rest, education, sport, etc. It goes on and on. And in that, we also need to emphasize the transforming power of the Bible and this necessity to walk in the truth. A biblical worldview is meant to transform our living. We don't want to give our children the impression that as long as you know the truth about a topic, that's the end goal. The goal is transformation. The goal is walking in the truth. We also can help them to see that there's nothing new under the sun. God's truth is timeless. Our children are under tremendous pressure to conform to the world. And the world would have them see the Bible as a relic of the past. And their confidence can be shaken by this. However, when you carefully examine modern issues through the lens of scripture, you find that these issues are really old issues dressed up in new and fancier clothes. For example, in Bible times, some people trusted in horses and chariots. In our time, some people trust in electricity, smartphones, and high-performance vehicles. It was folly to trust in the former, and it's folly to trust in the latter. There is truly nothing new under the sun but we need to help our children to make these timeless biblical connections. Number four, teach our children to evaluate all things through the truth of scripture. In other words, biblical discernment. In Romans 12, two and in Hebrews 5, 14, 
we look at words like testing, discerning, distinguishing. We need to teach our children how to do these things. So we have to continually ask, what does the Bible say about this? An illustration, many years ago when our kids were very little, we were driving in the car and there was a Christian song on the radio. And basically it was kind of saying, God needs our hands, God needs our feet, God needs our self, et cetera, et cetera. And I asked my kids, is that true? What does the Bible say? Can you give me a verse? And right away they came up with Acts 17, 25, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. So even a quote Christian song on the radio, is this true? You have to measure everything against the truth of the Bible. So we must teach our kids to examine, test, and evaluate ideas and arguments. And unfortunately, modern educational philosophy often teaches our kids to be passive learners and not critical learners. So we need to teach our kids how to think critically. And we should make the Bible the first stop for evaluating whether something is true or false, good or evil. We need to ask probing questions and go to the Bible and make this a habit and encourage our kids to see the Bible as the ultimate authority by which everything else is measured. We also need to point out the futility of unbiblical ideas and arguments. For example, someone says there are no absolutes. Well, have your child critically examine this statement. Why is it contradictory and foolish to say this? It's using an absolute to say there are no absolutes. We need to train our kids' minds to be able to see this. Or an Olympic swimmer after winning eight gold medals stated, I have accomplished all. I will have these medals forever. You know, when you come across a statement like this with your kids, don't simply let it pass by or roll your eyes. Use it as a means of examining the futility of an unbiblical view. Did he really accomplish everything? Will he really be able to keep these medals forever? What does the Bible say? Now for older students, we can teach them a guided step-by-step -step approach to evaluate any situation or topic. And here's just an example of some steps we could go through. Step number one, carefully examine the real issues and message involved. Now think back to our beginning article of Joel, Joel the wrestler. He was participating in a sporting event. And on the surface, this particular event was much like any other involving two wrestlers. But on careful examination, there were bigger issues involved because one of the participants was a young man and one was a young woman. There's a huge issue at stake here that wasn't being seen by the school officials and by some of the others who commented. It gets down to what does it mean to be a young man and how should a young man relate to a young woman? We must train our children to get at the bottom of things. Or think of the amount of time our children spend in media-related activities. Are we teaching them to, under, to examine the underlying messages in the books they read, the movies they watch, the music they listen to, and the video games they play? Take, for example, the hugely popular movie Avatar. Did they see through all the colorful and high-tech visual effects and notice that at its core, it was promoting pantheism? or was it just entertainment? We must teach our students to carefully examine everything and ask, what are the real issues at stake here? And once we've recognized these, we need to go to the Bible to test and evaluate these ideas in light of biblical truth, which is step number two. Search the truth in scripture. Now, we all know about GPS systems and compasses. Too many times we approach the Bible as if it's a GPS. You type in exactly what you're looking for, and in an instant you get step-by-step -step directions. You type in, should a guy wrestle a girl, and your topical Bible program should come out with the right answer, correct? No. 
wrong. Yes, there are times when the Bible is more like a GPS. For example, Jesus is the only way to God. It's very clear. But for most situations we encounter, the Bible is more like a compass. Yes, it provides a fixed point, but we have to learn how to properly orient ourselves to this fixed point. And we need to train our children how they can do that. For example, we need to ask important and appropriate questions. Does the scripture specifically address this issue? What tools do I need to find out? For example, there are online Bible programs when you can do word searches and topical Bible programs. In the example of whether a young man should wrestle a girl, you might be looking for tests that specifically address qualities of manhood and womanhood. We also can ask, are there similar situations presented in scripture? In the case of a guy wrestling a girl, are there situations in which a man used physical force in relation to a woman? If so, was this seen in a positive light or a negative light? Or are there any situations in scripture where a woman is seen trying to dominate a man? If so, how is this interpreted? Another question, do I have sinful desires that are causing me to look past the truth? We all approach the truth of scripture with sinful inclinations. And if we don't recognize these as such, it will hinder a right interpretation and application of God's truth. For example, the desire to be Mr. Iowa in the wrestling world could cause a young man to look past the truth of scripture concerning manhood and womanhood. Another thing, would my understanding of this be according to Christ? Would Jesus be pleased with my understanding of this topic? Would my thinking honor him? And what will my actions demonstrate to others about God? Will my attitude, words, and actions proclaim the excellencies of God, his good and sovereign rule, his reputation and fame? If my response is lawful, will it also be helpful? You hear a lot of kids talking about, you know, will they we watch lots and lots of movies, but they're all good. They're all good. Well, it may be lawful, but is it beneficial? Do you have a biblical worldview of your entertainment and media habits? Is it causing you to grow in godliness? Those are questions you should be asking. Step five, we should have our kids seek out wisdom from others. Have you provided your children with some mature godly counselors that they can go to for advice? And even more important, have you cultivated an atmosphere in the home and in your classrooms that encourages the students to seek out advice without feeling demeaned or berated? Do you willingly give them your time? If we want our children to feel comfortable doing this, we must be open to all their honest questions. No topic should be off the table. We might need to defer a question to a more appropriate venue, but it should be taken seriously. Then we need to encourage our students to submit to God's word and authority and do what is right. There may have been a struggle in the mind of young Joel before making his decision not to wrestle. But our children need to see that God's truth is absolute and we are to submit our desires and actions to his authority. Now there is one I missed, that was step number four, ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. You know, too often we readily ignore to miss the very guide and power that God has given to every believer and the Holy Spirit guides us in truth. And so we need to take time, teach our kids to take time and sit and pray. Now, as you can see, biblical discernment isn't like a light switch that you just flip on. It requires thought, study, and interaction with the scriptures. It requires humble submission to the truth, and it requires constant practice. But with that practice comes an increased ability to discern what is good and evil and to have a biblical view of everything. Fifth, we need to teach our children the enlightening and transforming truth of the gospel. A simple diagram I use with students is Satan lies plus a sinful heart you will reject the truth and have other worldviews. God's truth and by God's grace a new heart will lead you to trust in Jesus and a biblical worldview. 
A true biblical worldview involves embracing the gospel, and this is by God's grace and power alone, where he removes the lies of Satan that blind us to the truth and gives us a new heart to love and embrace Jesus and walk in his truth. We cannot create faith in our children and students. We cannot create a biblical worldview in them, but we can and must present them with God's truth for without it, there will be no faith and no progressive transformation. Number six, teach our children that biblical worldview is meant to point them to true, lasting joy. Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and delight of my heart. And we cannot help our children in that by pointing out the many benefits of walking in God's truth. It's protection from the harmful consequences of sin, clean conscience, experiencing God's approval, good witness to others, and emphasize the merits of long-term joy versus fleeting pleasures. Uh, the culture often portrays the truth of the Bible as the ultimate joy killer, and Christians as gloomy, uptight legalists. And that is not the truth. A biblical worldview is like corrective lenses that offer us clear sight so that we can avoid danger and direct our steps in a way that will give us true lasting joy. Eric, uh, runner Eric Little had a very biblical view of sports. He saw it as a means to grow in godliness and glorify God. Yes, he did back in the 1920s give up an opportunity to win another Olympic gold medal. But he had a clean conscience which is why he could state, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. And that brought him more lasting joy than any medal. God's truth is meant to produce joy, not kill it. But we must teach our children to understand the difference between fleeting worldly pleasures and true lasting joy. And when they choose to embrace truth and walk in obedience to it, we should point this out and infirm it as evidence of God's grace in their life. For example, just a simple illustration. Last year in Sunday school in seventh and eighth, we had one girl who, her demeanor was so godly, so modest. She was always dressed very modestly. And I just would make it a point to go up and thank her for her modest attire and try to offer words of encouragement because the world will not encourage that in our young ladies. Or suppose a child goes to a friend's house and want to watch a movie but decides halfway through to leave because he realizes the movie isn't appropriate. We should encourage and praise our children for those kinds of decisions. Encourage them in walking in godliness. Also, we need to remind them that in the end, God's truth will triumph over all other competing truth claims, all false philosophies, ideas, arguments, and religions. In the midst of living in an increasingly unbiblical worldly culture, it's often easy to get really discouraged, and that discouragement can steal away our joy. For example, you can feel like an outcast at school because you don't believe in evolution or you oppose same-sex marriage. We need to remind our children and ourselves that truth, the truth of God will ultimately triumph. And this truth should give us a strong foundation for joy-filled confidence and boldness. And we also need to teach our kids what it means to be strangers and aliens in this world. Sometimes you will stand apart and you will stand alone. Seven, we need to teach our children to boldly proclaim God's truth in a spirit of humility. There is a danger in giving our kids a rock-solid confidence in God's absolute and authoritative truth, and that's that they would express a cocky, arrogant boldness. John Piper had a great quote. Being Christian exiles in American culture does not end our influence. It takes the swagger out of it. We need to demonstrate this to our children through our own demeanor and our words. If our words are sarcastic, if they're cocky, if they're arrogant, we are passing that on to our children. Our children need to see our tears for the lost. They need, like us, 
to acknowledge our own deceitful heart. And apart from God's grace, we could not have a biblical view of anything either. And we need to remind them that the goal of presenting God's truth is that sinners might be saved. The goal of proclaiming a biblical worldview is not that we might have the upper hand in the culture or be part of the moral majority. It's that sinners would come to love the God of truth. And we need to remind them ultimately that it is not, that it is not us who saves, but God who saves and brings people to the truth. We need to give our children a strong defense for what they believe and to develop a practice of humble, prayerful dependence. Now, I want you to see a photo. There it is. That's a photo, and you can see by his outfit, he's a soldier. And he is my son. And he is in Afghanistan right now, and he is in danger. He has an enemy that wants to kill him and an enemy that has tried to kill him. He is at war. And as a mother, that's hard. But you know what? Your kids are at war too. Your students are at war. And it is much more deadly than that war that my son is experiencing right now. And they are facing an enemy that is much more deadly than the Taliban or any terrorist. There is a war of worldviews going on. It's a war that's being waged in the heart and mind of every person, and it spills out into every sphere of life and culture. It's a war pitting God's truth against the lies of Satan's. And our children need to know this so that they will not be surprised by opposition. And they need to know how to be equipped and to stand and fight. So finally, we need to teach our children to expect opposition and be prepared to stand firm. Several years ago during a presidential debate, a candidate answered a question concerning evolution by rejecting the scientific theory of evolution in a thermian affirming biblical truth. His simple statement of truth became the source of instant media ridicule throughout the country and even the world. People were saying, and this guy might become the president of the United States? Are you guys in the dark ages? If we and our children embrace biblical worldview, this kind of reaction from the world will be the norm, not the exception. And our children need to know this and be prepared for it. They need to know that Satan has many schemes and weapon options meant to fight against the truth. Our children need to know that if they are to stand, and they need the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 describes what we're up against and what we need to stand, the full armor of God. We need to point out to our children wh what it is, the armor that they need to put on and how they need to stand. We can do this by pointing out evidences of God's grace in their lives and use this to encourage them. If they are believers, point to evidences of God's power in their life. Encourage your soldier in the fight. You can say, I know that was difficult for you to not cave in when the other kids were teasing you about not being willing to cheat on your homework. It's wonderful to see how God gave you strength to do what was right. You're giving them armor and encouraging them to stand. And remind them that Jesus and others have experienced ridicule. You are not alone. Look how Jesus and others responded. And pray with your students and children, demonstrating our daily and ongoing need to ask for Jesus' strength and protection. And another thing that was really important in the lives of my children is finding like-minded friends and mentors. This was so important. They didn't always have a lot of like-minded friends when it came to worldview, but those who they did have were key to encouraging them to stand firm. And especially the older um, mentors in their lives. Now, my son, when he, 
he knew he was going to war in Afghanistan. He was well trained and he was well equipped. He knows the enemy, he knows how the enemy fights, and he knows how to use his weapons well. When he goes outside the wire on a mission, he's on hyper alert. But I am much more concerned about the other war he's in, the war of worldviews. Are we equipping our children to stand firm? Do they even know they're in a war? I feel sometimes like my son is more safe in Afghanistan as a believer facing rocket mortar than many of our children here who are not even in the fight. And one of the schemes of Satan is indifference. We must teach our children there is a war of worldviews going on. We must equip them to stand. Do they have an unshakable confidence in the absolute and authoritative truth of Scripture? That is the one, when you look at the list in Ephesians 6, the one offensive weapon every believer is given is what? The sword of truth. So, biblical worldview is seeing and interpreting all of life through the truth of Scripture. Now, we started this seminar with the story of a young man who forfeited a wrestling match rather than wrestle a young woman. One small event in a very busy world, in a very busy, complicated world. Joel's forfeit may not change the world, but it does shine out as a light in an increasingly dark culture. It demonstrates that worldview matters in all that we do. Let us pray that our children see everything in life clearly for the glory of God and their eternal joy. It's really a big deal. <laughs>